grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God the Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Can you resist God? Let me, let me back up, make sure you're with me in this series on the Holy Spirit. We've been going with the phrase Pastor John gave us at the beginning, is the Father working through the Son by the power of the Holy Spirit. Now we know is, is that God is all-powerful. It's one of those confirmation words that we had to learn, right? Is omnipotent. God is omnipotent. God is all-powerful. God can do whatever He wants. So the question becomes, can we resist the working of the Holy Spirit? I don't sell my sermon, assassin. Because <laughs> that's especially important because as we deal with the question that I get more than anything, this is hands down, and when the subject of the Holy Spirit comes up, this is hands down the number one question I get. What's this sin against the Holy Spirit? What's this unforgivable sin? So let me tell you a couple of stories. Let's call, let's call the first guy Pete. Now, I'll say it's right up front. Pete is a compilation of several people, that, many people that I've talked to. Uh, and Pete is not a real person, but around here, if you've been around here long, any time at all, Pete's the guy who has all the problems at St. Andrew. So... Um, Pete wakes up in the morning and he's feeling okay about life and okay with his relationship with God. He spends time in the morning in the Word of God, spends time in the morning with prayer and he's doing okay with God. Uh, and he starts in through his day and about middle of the afternoon, Pete's starting to realize the things he's done wrong, not only that day, but the things he's done wrong in his life and in his past. And they're kind of weighing on him. By dinner time, he's beginning to really feel the weight and the reality of the, his hopelessness, the despair, the train wreck, the mess he's made in his life. That's about dinner time. It begins to set in. And by bedtime, he's convinced he's going to hell that his life and the sins he's committed and the stuff that he's done is so grievous and so offensive that God can't even forgive him. He's convinced that he's made the sin against the Holy Spirit and just let him go to hell right now and get everything over with. And see, the thing that Pete, with Pete is that, you know, we talked about the Father working through the Son, through the power of the Holy Spirit, working in His Word. What Pete's hearing is the Holy Spirit also uses the law. Holy Spirit uses the law to bring us to the reality of our sins, the reality of our desperateness. The reality is that, is that we're train wrecks before God, that we're a mess. Whatever word you want to stick in there, if you're a good old Lutheran, you used to say, poor miserable sinner... Although you've heard, heard us say also that we're not miserable sinners. We're actually really good at it. But that's another sermon. Peace beginning to realize the depravity in his life. That's the Holy Spirit working in through the word to bring the depravity in his life. What Pete's missing is Pete's missing hearing this message of the gospel. As the gospel is not about this forgiveness of sins. It's not about what we do. It's not about how good we are or how bad we are. It's what God does in our lives. It's God coming to us. It's God coming to us through water and the word that's forgiven our sins. It's God coming to us and making us his and making that promise in baptism that when we're baptized, all our sins have been forgiven. That's what Pete needs to hear. As opposed to a guy by the name of Lynn. Lynn is a real guy. 
I caught up with Lynn at my vicar's congregation. My supervising pastor said, go out and talk to Lynn. I know he's got some issues. Um, you're closer to the seminary stuff than I am, so you go talk to him. Maybe you can talk with, some, talk with him. And I says, okay. And I went out and talked to Lynn. And, um, Lynn was really upfront about the first issue that we talked about. He, he said, vicar, I got a problem with this resurrection of the dead. I got a problem with, with this at the last day that Jesus is going to raise us, everybody from the dead. Because I want to know, am I going to get my 25-year-old body that was really good and really strong and really healthy, or my 85-year-old broken body? <laughs> and I said, Lynn, you're missing the point. Because it doesn't matter. Because when the body's raised from the dead, is is he said God says he's making all things new. All those effects of sin, all that stuff in our lives is going away. Whatever God uses, it's gonna be great. But Lynn never got there. And this conversation went over and over and over again over a course of about six months. And one day when I was talking to Lynn, he, he came to me and he said, he said, Vicar, the first question we've been talking about, I don't think is my real question. And I thought, okay, this ought to be good. And he said, I don't believe that Jesus rose from the dead. And I said, okay, why not? And he says, well, because it's just an impossibility. People don't rise from the dead. Do you know anybody's risen from the dead? And I go, well, yeah, Jesus. And he goes, well, that doesn't count. And, and nobody does that. Nobody can rise from the dead. It's a, phys- it's a possibility. God can't even do that. And I started in, I started talking about 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And I talked about the, the Gospels. And we talked over and over at this. And he said, Vicar, I just can't believe this. And I go, Lynn, this is the ball game. This is the ball game. This is everything. This is everything our faith rests on. You give this up, you're giving up everything. I cannot repeat the words that he said to me. So the question becomes, did Pete commit the sin of the unforgivable spirit? Or unforgivable sin? See, the problem is, is that we, we can't definitively know. It appears that he did. I left my vicarage, vicarage convinced that he was on, his path, on the path. But see, I wasn't there at his deathbed. He died after I left vicarage congregation. I don't know if he repented. I don't know if he went back on that. See, the, the, the thing about unforgivable spirit, unforgivable sin is we can't tell for sure. We can see maybe they have, maybe they haven't. We can see evidence but you get right down to it you really can't tell until the person's died and the one who makes that judgment is God there's an old Lutheran line that I didn't use because I needed to get you to this point that basically says this because it sounds a little flippant but it sums it up perfectly well is that if you're worried that you've committed this unforgivable sin stop because you haven't Because those people who have committed the unforgivable sin don't care. Pete cared. Pete's problem is Pete just needed to hear the gospel again. He needed to have the gospel reinforced in his head. Lynn didn't care. Lynn didn't care about anything. And it's especially important when we start talking about this resist. Can we resist the Holy Spirit? Because when we talk, talk about resisting the Holy Spirit, this, this unforgivable sin is, is one of those things that I like to say, all, although many of us struggle with Pete's issue, the thing about the unforgivable sin for most of us is one of those intellectual things that teases our brain and we want to know more about. But there's something else about the resisting the Holy Spirit that I think is much more... Um, a problem and a much more deadly for us. And I call it the slippery slope. 
And let me, let me describe the slippery slope this way. There's a congregation that, has, that worships on Sunday morning, and in the congregation there's a gentleman that sits over on this side in the back corner, which I'll explain for a reason why in a minute. He sits over, always sits over on this side in the back corner over here, and there's nobody in this congregation. This is not this congregation, by the way, so I'm pointing at John Daniel. It's not you, John. <laughs> okay? I just realized John Daniel's going, ah! It's not you, John, all right? He sits over in the back corner over here, and there's a guy, this is not David over here either, and it sits up on the front corner, this corner over here, right? They're both good. They both say the creed we just said, one holy Christian apostolic church. They, all, they both believe they're by the body of Christ. They both sit there and say, uh, yes, God has forgiven our sins. He's made us a child of God. We're one holy family, one family that God has made us. They both sit and they pray, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And in their head they're going, as long as it's not that guy. Or that guy. Because 20 some odd years ago, somebody did something to somebody and said something to somebody, and they get their families are at war. Literally at war. There's a reason that one guy sits at the top and one guy at the bottom, because if they sit this way, they never have to be at the communion table together. Because that would be the worst. And they sit, they, sit, they, they sit and they say, this one holy Christian apostolic church, they say there's one, one going in, either one family, but as long as it's not that guy over there. There's another congregation I'm very familiar with over in the western side of the state of Missouri. One of the things that they're telling their pastor is, is this. This is, Pastor, you need to preach the law more. And yes, that's, for a Lutheran, that's kind of funny, uh, pastor. But you're saying, pastor, you need to preach the law more. You need to tell us what we need to do more. You need to preach the law and what God expects of us and how we should live our lives. And you need to preach it with force, pastor. And at the same time they're saying, preach the law with force, pastor, they're walking out of the church and gossip and lies are literally killing that congregation. Literally killing that congregation. But that's not the best. The best thing about that congregation is simply this. It's the same congregation and they're sitting there and what's happening, oh by the way, the gossip and lies are not just about the pastor. Uh, they're about each other too. Uh, it's not just lies and gossip about the, the guy in the road on the Sunday mornings. It's gossip and lies about everybody else. Everybody's fair game. But the other congregation, it's the same congregation, same issue, they're, they're dealing with this issue as well. And, and what's happening in this congregation is if something happens, something happens either intentional or something happens on, uh, by accident and somebody gets offended and they get offended and say, well, I'm not giving my money to my church. Make sure you cut the pronouns. I'm not giving my money to my church. And I'm sitting there screaming, wait a second. In the second part, we got two problems here. We need to make sure we correct. Number one, it's not your money. It's God's money. And number two, it's really not your church. It's his church. See this, as I call it, the slippery slope. is simply this. It's when we hear the word of God. We hear what God's saying in our lives and then ignore it. When we hear what God's telling us to do or said to act and we simply ignore it. Let me put it in terms we used last week. We talked about sanctification. It's that grace coming to us, that forgiveness of sins, that we're justified. God justifies us. God forgives us. He fills us with his grace so we can go and live that out in our world. That's what we talked about last week is living that forgiveness, living that grace out in our world. It's when we're good on the grace and good on this part and saying, nope, God, I'm not going to live in it out. That's when we get on the slippery slope. When we're hearing what God 
is giving to us and hearing what God is expecting us and hearing what God is telling us and then we're going out and simply ignoring it. That puts us on a slippery slope. When we talk about slippery slopes, though, my favorite story, I can't, my brain always goes to Peter and the disciples. For Peter and the disciples, you know the story. Peter and the disciples spent three years with Jesus. Make sure you catch that. Three years with this man. Three years with the Son of God. Three years of hearing him. Three years of just being with him every day. Three years of... of of seeing the miracles. They were right there. In some aspect of the miracles, they were part of the miracle themselves is, is doing it. And three years of seeing this, they hear, they hear his words and they see what's going on and they hear words like this from Matthew chapter 10 where Jesus tells them, so everyone who acknowledges me before men, I will also acknowledge before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. And they get down to that last Passion Week, that last Passion Week of Jesus' life, and start begins with Palm Sunday, and they know what's going on. They're not dumb. They know there's tension. They know that Jesus' life is at stake. They, they know there's people who want to kill him. They know what's happening, but it comes to a head on that Monday, Thursday evening when they're all gathered together, and Jesus says, you're all going to bail. You're all going to run. And they go, no, we're not, no, we're not, no, we're not. And he goes, yeah, you are. You're going to bail. No, we're not, no, we're not, no, we're not. And he goes, yeah, you are. And Peter, you're falling the farthest. Just telling you. And you know how the story goes. A couple of hours later, they bail. All of them. Peter the worst. And they get to the get and they come after the resurrection after Jesus has risen from the dead and they realize that Jesus is still standing there with his arms open that Jesus is still standing there with his grace that Jesus is still standing there with forgiveness that Jesus still welcomes those with repentant hearts those who acknowledge their sin and how they fouled up, that he's still welcoming them in their lives. And it's a realizing for us as well, when we fall yet again, and when we're Peter's, or when we're Pete's, like a, not Peter the Apostle, Pete, like my first illustration, Pete, when we're Pete yet again in our lives, it's realizing that God's baptismal promise still stands. He forgives all our sins. I said this before a couple of weeks ago. I will say it again. Is this realization is that no matter what's going on from Romans chapter 5, you can't out-sin grace. God's grace is still there. And that God is there with open arms. For yes, those of us who are like live on the slippery slope, and yes, those of us who will sit and will hear the word of God and ignore him, his grace is still there. And his grace still calls us by name that we're his. So I began the sermon with the question, can you resist the Holy Spirit? And Sessa's answer was, well, I said yes. yes, it's still right. I just let it go because I didn't, I, I, I asked a setup question. I had, in, when, these people wanted to hear the rest of the other 15 minutes of the sermon. Can you resist the Holy Spirit? The answer is yes. If you want to know how and why that works, ask him when you get there. We can resist the Holy Spirit. But standing behind that is this phrase that we've been using all, this, all month. Is the Father working through the Son by the power of the Holy Spirit to bring us grace. That God is still there working through the Holy Spirit to receive sinners who repent. 
receive those who are fallen, to receive those whose lives are a train wreck and desperately need the love of Jesus Christ. That is still there. Bow your heads with me, please. Father in heaven, we give you thanks for this day, and we give you thanks more importantly for your grace and your mercy in your welcoming us, even, even though we live on that slippery slope, even though we're like the peats and continually make a mess of our lives. You receive us, and you bring us back, and you call us by name that we are yours. And we cling to your baptismal promise, and we cling to your gift that you give to us in our baptism. Amen.